much, Ari, and it's wonderful to be back. Thank you all for coming. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are in the world. And that was a nice shout out. Thank you for the introduction. I'm actually in front of Megiddo. That is my backdrop here with my screens. So if I can't be there in person, at least I bring it to me. So without further ado, let me see if I can share my screen and get my slides going for you. Can you let me know, are you able to see my slide? Yeah, everything's good? Okay. So what I wanna do first of all tonight is tell you what archeology span is not. It's not Indiana Jones, it's not Laura Croft. If you, like I, grew up on the Indiana Jones movies, that is not what we do in archeology. span But then again, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. What archaeology is, I think, is the coolest job on earth. Uh, I have this as a bumper sticker up in my office. I save the past. What do you do? A little challenging, but it does reflect um, my attitude. Uh, and I have another bumper sticker that says, uh, I'd rather be digging, which is pretty much exactly sums up my life right there. Now, the one problem, well, one of the problems with being an archaeologist uh, and, and traveling and giving lectures is that when people find out that I'm an archaeologist at cocktail parties, dinner parties, and all that, they always immediately have questions and statements that they say. So the most common was, uh, they would say, if I weren't a, and then fill it in, you know, an actor, a lawyer, um, you know, a financier, they say, if I weren't that, I would have been an archaeologist. To which I, with a perfectly straight face, say, oh, and if I hadn't been an archaeologist, I would have been, and then I name exactly what they are. And they always have this look of shock. Really? You were? I'm like, no, I'm kidding. No, I've wanted to be an archaeologist since I was seven years old. So no. So, but, so these are the things that I get. I also get um, questions, uh, which, you know, people, late night TV, people that watch Ancient Aliens, you know, is, is the Sphinx really 12,000 years old? The answer is no. And then I go on for a long spiel until their eyes glaze over, hoping that that will stop any more questions from coming. But it doesn't, because then they always ask me about Atlantis. And that's where I say, yes, Atlantis is in the Bahamas. It's a beautiful hotel. It's incredibly expensive. But, you know, if you want to go to Atlantis, you can go there. So this is, I would say, the downside to being an archaeologist star. You're always on show at any dinner party and any cocktail party. But, you know, I, I can deal with it. But what it means is that I'm, I'm always asked the same questions. And so that was in part why... I wrote this little book, uh, Digging Deeper, How Archaeology Works, which is a spinoff of the larger book that I wrote a couple of years ago uh, called Three Stones Make a Wall, uh, The Story of Archaeology. And that had interspersed chapters on how do you actually do the digging. So we decided to spin this off. And I was able to put in more data than I had in the original book and, in fact, added an entire chapter as well. So um, I wrote it for people like you, members of the general public who really want brief answers um, to their questions, or so you can show off so that you have your own cocktail party trivia and you don't need me there, but you can say if there's a break in the conversation, hey, did you know, and then you can be off and running. But I also wrote it for my friends and colleagues, other archaeologists who are also asked these questions and really don't know how to answer them. But I also wrote it because I run my own excavation. Uh, as Ari said, I was at Megiddo for 20 years and now I've been at uh, Tel Cabri for the last 15. And so I wanted this, it's a little book, it'll fit in your backpack uh, or your back pocket for people that are going on their first excavations, right? What can I expect? What would I, what would I do and all of that? Um, and so if any of you are planning on going on your own excavation, uh, this would be the, the thing to get. Uh, I kind of feel like I'm on late night TV, you know, but wait, there's more. So, but if you want it, that, that would be good. By the way, I see at least one other person seems to have Megiddo in their background too. So yay, excellent, way to go. Um, I also wanted it, since I teach an introduction to archeology span class, I wanted something that my students could get that wouldn't break the bank. So what I propose to do today 
afternoon, evening, whatever it is where you are, are to run through some of the questions that I'm asked and that I answer in the book uh, in large part so you don't have to go by the book because you've now got the answers. So it would be redundant. So um, I'm going to race through these because I don't want to spend um, more than an hour talking about these. In fact, I'll try and finish at about 10 minutes of, which will give you about 10, 15 minutes then to answer some questions. So if we begin at the beginning, I've already kind of given it away that I've really always wanted to be an archeologist. It was actually my mother's fault. Uh, and some of you may know this story uh, already uh, because I've told it um, so many times I've forgotten where I've told it. And I know that Ari, I've been lecturing to your group now, what, four or five times, always a joy. So this may be familiar to some of you, but my mother gave me the book that you see on the left, The Walls of Windy Troy, when I was seven years old. Uh, which is a little bit older than the picture of me on the right. Uh, that was when I was about three years old and was really cute back then. That's long gone. But my mother gave me this book when I was seven. I read it. It was a biography of Heinrich Schliemann, the man who found Troy. And I announced I was going to be an archaeologist. And my mother looked very proud. My father looked disappointed because he wanted me to be a doctor like him. But mom won out. And here I am as an archeologist. So one of the first books that I read, which I think probably a number of you have read as well, you see here on the left, it's C.W. Saram's book, God's Graves and Scholars. And in fact, my book, Three Stones Make a Wall, is meant as an update for Saram's book because the second edition that you see here on the left it came out in, I think it was 1967, and my book came out in 2017, which, if I'm not mistaken, is about 50 years later. So um, there was a lot found in those 50 years since Saram's book came out. But I also, in high school, um, read Incidents of Travel in Yucatan, uh, where we've got uh, John Lloyd Stevens and with plates by Frederick Catherwood. And this is all about um, the Maya and other ruins down in Central and South America. And so by the time I got to college, I was sure that I wanted to be an archeologist. And the neat thing was that that book, let's see if I can go back a moment here. I probably can't, but this book, the one on the left, The Walls of Wind, Detroit, my mother gave it to me again when I graduated from college. And she said, this is what started everything. And I actually now have two copies of it because I've got the original from when I was seven slash 21, and then one that I found on Amazon used. So I've got one in my home office, which I would hold up if it weren't on the bookshelf there, and one in my office at school so I can show the students when they come in to declare their major. And I say, this is what started me, what started you? So that is my long-winded answer to the first question they always ask me is how did you know um, and when did you know that you want to be an archaeologist? The other thing they always ask me, what's the best thing that I've ever found? We are all asked this. Every archaeologist I know, everybody always says you know, with kind of a sly look, what's the best thing you've ever found? So I can tell you that um, for a very long time that my answer was a petrified monkey's paw which I found at Tel Anafa, which is a site uh, up in the north of Israel. If you know where Kiryat Shmona is to the north of the um, Sea of Galilee, that was my very first dig. I was a sophomore in college. And um, they look at me and go, a petrified monkey's paw? Seriously? I'm like, well, let me tell you the story. So I won't take very long, but let me just show you. This is Tel Anafa in the lower right. It is a Greco-Roman city or town or dwelling, basically. Um, so it's Greek and Roman. And what we've got, there's me, tender age of, I think, 19. And we were digging out in the sun. Uh, back then, we were idiots about the sun. Uh, we dug without wearing any clothes, pretty much. I was in shorts, and that was it. And there were no um, shades or tents above us, uh, which was just insanity. Now we're, of course, now we're all dressed and our students 
are fully dressed as we dig. And we've got shade cloths above the site that will uh, cut out about 90% of the UV rays and we're much more um, conscientious. I even wear sunscreen these days, which I didn't used to back then because little tip, if you wear sunscreen, the dirt and the dust sticks to it. And then you come out just coated at the end of the day. Uh, so here we are, we're out in the hot blazing sun and I had been digging, we start digging at 5 a.m. And we go until about 8.30 when we stop for breakfast. And by that point, by 8, 8.30 in the morning, it's already like 95, 100 degrees, somewhere in there. So I had a little bit of heat stroke that morning. I, I almost always had heat stroke, actually. But this is what I found. And this is what I tell people was a petrified monkey's paw, because as I was digging with my little patiche, my, I'll show you a picture of a patiche, but it's a little digging hammer. Um, I, I was digging through with force and my, the head of my patiche struck this object such that it flipped up in the air, which is not how you're supposed to excavate. I should have been able to carefully clean around it and this and that. Anyway, I hit this thing with such force that it flew up in the air. And in my kind of brain addled um, sunstroke, I thought, ooh, a petrified monkey's paw because it's green. And then by the time it landed, and of course, everything's still in slow motion, I thought, that's stupid. It can't be a petrified monkey's paw because there weren't any monkeys in ancient Canaan or, you know, in ancient Israel. So it can't be that. And when it landed, I'm like, oh, my God, look at that. And it turns out it's actually a bronze bust. Originally, you can see on the label, we thought it was a lamp. It's not. You imagine if you're sitting in a wooden chair and at the end of the arms, there is a little something that you can hold on to as you're sitting. Well, that's what this is. This is one of the arm ends, shall we say. The other one is missing and the chair is long gone because it's wood, but this is the Greek god Pan. You know, the guy with little horns and the double flute that traped through the forest with everybody following him. So this is the end, it's like a filial, it's the end of a chair arm. And we took it back and cleaned it up and sent it down to the museum. And I never saw it again, not for 30 years. They sent it down to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem and they said, oh, it's on display, it's on display. For 30 years, I never saw it there. It turned out it was in the storerooms. But then in 2010, when we were digging at Kabri, which is not that far from Anafa, also in the north of Israel, one day we went down to the University of Haifa where my co-director, Asaf Yassor Landau teaches. And he said, look, I got some stuff to do. Why don't you go over to our little museum, the Hecht Museum, where actually my friend uh, Iran Arye is now the director. And so I wandered into the Hecht Museum and there's the Greco-Roman room and I'm standing in the doorway and I look all the way across, maybe about 30 feet across. And I say, wow, that looks just like the one I found. And I went up and I got closer. I'm like, that is the one I found. And then there was a little sign that said on temporary loan from the Israel Museum. So like uh, any good person in this day and age, I took a selfie right, in front of it. And it was a good thing I did because the next weekend I brought my students back and I said, I'm going to show you what I found when I was your age, because right, they're all sophomores and juniors. We walked into the room and it was gone they had sent it back to the Israel Museum. And they're like, pictures of it, or it didn't happen. And I'm, I whipped out my camera. I'm like, here, look, look. So anyway, so that was the best thing I found, which I told people for 30, 35 years. And it was on the very first season that I ever went digging out of you know 30 years. That though all changed when we started digging at Cabri way up north. And I hope some of you will come digging with us uh, we'll probably go not this summer, but next summer, 2023, after Omicron is gone. But in 2013 at Kabri, which is a Canaanite site, I've lectured on it for your group, I do uh, believe, um, we found a wine cellar. We found the oldest and largest wine cellar from um, the ancient Near East. It's about 4,000 years old, and we've got about 150 jars that each stand about 
three feet tall and would have held the equivalent of about 20,000 bottles of wine in modern terms. So now that's the best thing I found is an ancient wine cellar. But if you had told me when I was seven years old that that was going to be the best thing, I probably would have said, you know, a petrified monkey's paw is a lot cooler. So, you know, but whatever. So that is what I now tell people that the best thing I found, because we made all all the newspapers, New York Times, Time Magazine, Wall Street Journal. And, you know, after that, what more is there? Then you can retire. All right. But anyway. OK, now, in terms of actually doing archaeology, and I assume that some of you have been on digs. I also assume that those of you that haven't been on digs want to go, um, whether you can or not. Who knows? Omicron and and COVID and everything are really stopping us in our tracks. But in terms of how do we know where to look? How do we know where to dig? Let me just show you again so you can show off at cocktail parties this weekend or, or even at dinner later this evening. Um, there are basically two big ways to find ancient sites. One is from the ground and the other is from the air, which again, it's not rocket science. That's pretty much what you might have expected except that the ground reconnaissance, not only are you walking over the ground looking for it, but now we can use remote sensing and we can do that both at ground level and from space, uh, aerial reconnaissance as well. So let me just show you very quickly an example of what we call a pedestrian survey where you're actually walking on foot. This was a project that I was on in Greece southern Greece back in 1992. It is in the area around the late Bronze Age Mycenaean Palace of Pylos. And what we wanted to see is who was living in the area around the Palace of Pylos in about 1200 BC, so 3200 years ago, but also who was living there both before and after, all the way to modern day. So in this area, even though you can't see it, there are, whoops, Come back here. There are early Bronze Age sites, late Bronze Age sites. Um, there are classical Greek sites. There are Roman sites. There are Ottoman sites. There are Byzantine sites. They're all in there. So the way that we did it, and this is standard practice. If you're doing this pedestrian survey, you are literally walking the area. So you can see that we've lined up on a road here. Um, bear in mind, this is before GIS and GPS were so prevalent. Um, we had to use these ancient things that you may or may not be familiar with. They're called maps. That's spelled M-A-P-S in case you don't know about those. But we had to find where we are on the map. So we would locate usually a road or a riverbed or something like that. We line up about 15 meters apart. So 45 to 50 feet apart. And then when the team leader, that would be me, blows the whistle, everybody walks straight ahead, right? Off the road to the left into that olive grove. And they walk straight ahead, usually about the length of a football field, about 100 meters or so. And as they walk, they have a clicker in their hand. I know some of you know these clickers, but also like when you go to a football game or something, you go through this turnstile and it clicks to register you. Well, you can have one in your hand and every time you see a piece of a broken pot, a pot shirt, or a worked stone tool or a bit of an ancient wall, you would click once. And as you walk, you would stop. Out of those hundred meters, you'd stop about every 10 meters or so, and you record the number of clicks that you had on your clicker. So as you're going, the idea is that if there is an ancient site there, they will have broken a lot of pottery, which you know we still do today. You break the china, you break a plate. If there is an ancient site there, there will be tons of pottery. If there's no site there, there will just be either no pottery or little random scatters. So if I were walking those 100 meters and I were stopping to record the clicks every 10 meters, my count at the end would go something like zero, five, 100, 250, 12, five, zero, zero, zero. And you can see I've walked over the site where I had that 
highest number, right? Where it was like 250. The people on either side of me will have similar numbers, but the people that are way out who might have missed the site, their counts are going to be like 0, 5, 5, 10, 6, 8, 0, you know, just like random background noise. So you can almost always find a site by what's come up. Now, to anticipate your question, why does the pottery rise to the surface? Well, not all of it will, but a certain percentage will. And it's because of what you might expect. Erosion, gophers bringing it to the surface, farmers plowing, things like that. But they'll always come up. And the interesting thing is, if you have a site that is inhabited in many different periods, the pottery on the surface will reflect that. So if you've got a site that was early Bronze Age and classical Greek and Byzantine, you will find sherds from those three periods right there. All right, so you walk and you walk and you walk. You hope you don't get lost. We got lost all the time. This is me and um, my, uh, my co-director trying to find out where the heck we were. Right? We would do that again and again, but we would also, once we figured out where we were on the map, we would mark on the map where we were, and then we would pick up these diagnostic pieces of pottery. If you look carefully at these, you will see they are all representative of the part of a vessel. There are rims there, there are handles, there are bases, or there are pieces that are decorated. This is so that when we take them back, to the base camp and show them to our pottery experts, they are able to say not only, oh, that's early bronze, but they can say, oh, that's early bronze too. And oh yeah, um, and that's um, probably fourth century BC. So you're not classical, you're getting close to Hellenistic Greek, that kind of thing. So that's how you find the sites to begin with. Once you find them then, if there's something interesting, another team will frequently go out after you've described for everybody what you've got, and that's me on the right, uh, telling everybody what we had found that week, you will frequently then send another team out to go to specifically the sites that you found to look at them again and see if they're worth digging. So I'll give you an example from Cabri, where we started digging in 2005, and then we realized, wait, we wanna see what was around us at the time, so here is Cabri off to the left with yellow and orange. We spent 2006 and 2007 doing what we call an intensive survey. We went back to sites that other groups had already found and we resurveyed just those sites. This I have to admit I liked very much because we drove to the site. We didn't have to walk over everything. The problem with doing a pedestrian survey when you walk those hundred meters straight, you are going straight. You might fall down a cliff. You might wade through a river. There might be a bull in a farmer's field. There might be a farmer in a farmer's field with a shotgun. Uh, so I much prefer to do intensive survey where we can drive to the site. And if it's on someone's land, we knock on their door and we ask permission to walk on the site. And there we are gathering our pottery and confirming Yes, this is Middle Bronze One. Yeah, this is early second millennium BCE, just like Cabri. And then to show other archaeologists that someone has been there, we leave the diagnostic pottery on a rock in the field so that somebody coming along knows that somebody else was there. So pedestrian, ex uh, extensive and intensive surveys. Once you do that, you then know where to go to dig and you can come back with the proper permit and the tools and the money and all of that. But in the interim, since I started surveying, we now have been able to use remote sensing. And this is where we can peer under the ground using a variety of technological advances And so penetrating radar, and that's exactly what it sounds like. It's radar, sends a signal down, it bounces, but it penetrates the ground 
and you are able to see what's underneath without even having to dig. The problem with that is interpretation. What we need to do always, and we learned this the hard way, is to do something called ground truthing, as in you get on the ground and you try to figure out the truth because that sometimes the images that come back when you use GPR, ground penetrating radar, can give you a false idea of what's there. So for instance, they were saying for the longest time, and this is just back in 2015, that they had found a larger henge by Stonehenge. They called it Superhenge. Some of you may remember that. But when they went to go dig it up, it turned out that what they thought were huge monolithic stones were actually pits in the earth filled with chipstone. What they were doing, we're not quite sure, but it wasn't huge stones. So they had to retract everything. And then they're like, oh, well, maybe it was of wood, which I rather doubt. There's no way it was wood. But so we don't quite know what was going on here, but it's not like a super hinge. Um, the other example I would give is at uh, Troy, where they said they had found a huge wall. And then when they went to dig it up, it turned out it wasn't a wall. It was a ditch. But the ditch had full, filled up with stones and wood and garbage and all that over the years. So the ground penetrating radar showed it as solid when in fact it wasn't solid at all. And the people at Troy who had said, hey, we found evidence of the Trojan War, they kind of backtracked and said, oh, well, you know, a ditch is as good as a wall for defense, to which I looked at them and went, um, no, it's not. No, I'll, I'll take a wall over a ditch any day. So now we know when we do uh, any kind of remote sensing to uh, do ground truthing before we hold a press conference. Also, it doesn't always work. In addition to ground penetrating radar, one of the big things to use these days is a magnetometer. This measures the magnetic um, field that the earth has. If anybody's done any activity in antiquity, built a wall, dug a ditch, whatever, it will have disturbed the magnetic force. Magnetometers can tell you if there's something underneath by measuring the amount of iron that's in the, in the soil and so on. Sometimes it works really, really, really well. The previous picture at Megiddo didn't work at all. Here at Zinjuli Huyuk up in Turkey uh, that David Sloan from Chicago um, was excavating, this is what they saw with their magnetometer. Everything that's kind of reddish brown there, you can see ancient buildings right there. None of that's been excavated. That's all just with a magnetometer. It worked absolutely beautifully. The middle section, that's been excavated. This out here, all the reddish brown, that is waiting to be excavated. But now they're able to say to donors, we can guarantee we're going to find something because we can see it already. We just don't know what artifacts are going to be in there. So magnetometer worked um, as injury. It also worked really well at Troy, even though, as I said, they uh, misinterpreted the wall for a ditch but they were actually able to find an entire, um, let me go back, go back, go back, hold on, hold on, hold on, right here, doo, doo, doo. there we go. They were able to find an entire lower city at Troy using a magnetometer. And now it turns out Troy is 10 to 15 times larger than we thought it was, which is really kind of neat. But that's where they made the mistake. And I give you here the example um, the first news broke back in 93 that they had found this wall, and then um, <laughs> outer wall of Troy appears to be a ditch. So you've got to really watch out what you are doing. Um, now, we tried a magnetometer at our site of Cabri, and here, uh, this is where Asaf, my co-director, showed me this very proudly, and he's like, look, 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 we got results from the magnetometer. I'm like, yeah, I guess this Canaanite site was inhabited by ancient amoebas. I mean, that's really exciting. And he's like, those aren't amoebas. I'm like, they look like amoebas to me. Looks just like what's on my tie. And he's like, no, no, you're not being serious. Um, and as it turned out, he had used another type of remote sensing, electric conductivity, which is where you put two poles in the ground and you run an electric current between the two of them. If there is a wall in there, it will interrupt the current, of course, 
Um, and if there isn't anything, the current will just continue. And here, here is where I said, okay, you've got something because you can see in the purple and pink areas, the outline of walls that are underneath the ground. So I didn't believe them with the magnetometer and the amoebas, but with electric conductivity, I did. And that was why we started excavating at Cabri because we knew up here in the black and white and gray, that was what the expedition before us had already found. And we now had evidence that there was more there. And that's why we went back. And so in our very first season, 2005, you can see we put down uh, trenches in the purple areas. But here is where I learned a valuable lesson also, namely remote sensing might tell you something is there, but it doesn't tell you how deep it is. So you have to do ground truthing also. And I think I've told uh, this audience this story when I was lecturing on Cabri, um, we started digging that first season in 2005 and found absolutely nothing the first day and the second day and the third day and the fourth day. And when I say, usually when archeologists, you know, when you say, what'd you find today? They say nothing. They still mean you found hundreds of sherds, but in our case, we had literally found nothing. And so I was sending the volunteers to the swimming pool and over to the sea, to the beach. And I would just, and nine days went by, 10 days went by, 11 days. We're halfway through our season. We've got absolutely nothing. And a guy from the kibbutz comes down and <clears throat> looks into our, uh, one of our squares. And he says, how deep are you? And we said, we're about, we're about five feet deep. And he said, oh, um, okay, you should probably find something starting in about two, three days. We said, why do you say that? He says, well, at the rate you're going, you'll get down to about six feet deep in like another two days. And um, that's where you'll find stuff. And we said, uh, how do you know? Are you an archaeologist? He said, no, I'm the guy who brought in six feet of earth when we planted the avocado trees. We're like, wait, what? <laughs> He's like, yeah, why didn't you ask? We're like, well, why didn't you just tell us? He's like, I didn't know what you guys were doing. So lesson learned. First of all, remote sensing tells you there's something there, but not how deep it is. Other lesson, ask the locals. They may have something that will help you. And indeed, two days later, you can see in the upper left corner here, we hit uh, plaster floors and walls in all of our areas. And we even found Cypriot pottery that was in a destruction layer on the floor. So valuable lessons learned. All right, now, the other thing that you can do though, if you're up in the air, this is where the newest breakthroughs have come through in remote sensing. Because when you're up in the air, you can see things that you can't see on the ground. Um, for one thing, vegetation grows differently, what we call crop marks, where you can see if something's under the ground or not, just from an airplane. But, you know, back in the um, 50s or so, there was a Cold War program called Corona that took black and white photographs all over the Near East, looking to see what was going on. They have now declassified those photographs. And so people like Jesse Kasana, who at the time was um, at University of Arkansas, now he's up at Dartmouth, they are looking at these Corona spy satellite images and look, <laughs> there's Tel Rifat in Syria, right, sitting there. It wasn't why the spy satellite took the picture in the first place, but there it is. So Corona now is something that a lot of archeologists are using, these declassified satellite photographs, but we've also now got new things, new satellite images. And that's where people like Sarah Parkak come in. She calls herself the space archeologist, good friend of mine, really, really impressive what she does. Um, you can see the pictures up top here. She takes satellite images and then um, corrects for color and other things that are in the atmosphere and is able to get everything that is noise out of the picture. And so she winds up with a picture like this, top right hand picture, that's ancient Tanis, like ancient Tanis in Egypt, like where Indiana Jones went to find the, you know, the lost ark and all that, um, which by the way is a different lecture, but never mind. Anyway, so Sarah Parkak is now using um, space imagery 
And if you, um, if you want, she's got a, a book that's published that's quite good uh, called, I think it's Archaeology from Space. Um, the other thing you can do, kind of the newest kid on the block, is this LIDAR, light radar, uh, or light detecting and ranging. Uh, it looks like this. This is a LIDAR machine. It will map in just a couple of hours, whatever you want, accurate to like two millimeters, and it's hundreds of thousands of data points. We uh, actually used it at Cobry at ground level to map our wine cellar. Uh, I think I've got a picture in a moment, but what people mostly use it for is airborne. You put it in a helicopter or you put it in a slow flying plane like a Cessna and you fly over jungle because LIDAR, it's just like ground penetrating radar, except it's up in the air. It can go right through the jungle, bounces its little beams off the ground and comes back up. This is an image from Tikal. Some of you know it, some of you have been there, a very important Maya city. All of this that you're looking at here is under the jungle canopy. You can't actually see this if you're there, but using LIDAR, you can see it. And so there are hundreds of buildings still to be excavated at Tikal, and now we can see them plain as day. Again, we don't know what's in them, but we know there that they are there. So this goes back out. Um, I think LIDAR really started to be used about a decade ago. This is an article from 2010. They were at Caracol, uh, which is another Maya city down in Belize. You can see some of the buildings are out here in the open, but look at the jungle all around them. Hundreds of buildings in that jungle. And they were able to map it using LIDAR in two or three days. And they came up with all kinds of things. If they had been on foot, probably would have taken them 30 years, but they did it in three days. And they're not just doing it in Central and South America. They are also doing it, for instance, in Cambodia, where an Australian archeologist uh, rented a helicopter and used LIDAR from there to uh, look at everything under the jungle canopy in Cambodia. So using lots and lots of high tech. Oh, hold on, I didn't want to go there. I actually clicked on the picture, didn't I? There we go. No, come back here. Why are you going there? There we go. So this is us using the LIDAR at ground level. As I say, it's not usually used at ground level, but you can see all of our wine jars there. Uh, that particular season in 2013, we had 40 jars and we had found them halfway through the season. So there was no way we could leave them over the winter because they would have all disintegrated. We needed to map them. It would have taken, oh gosh, at least three weeks to map them. We brought in these guys with their LIDAR machine and in three hours, they were able to map absolutely everything we had. And this is what LIDAR does. You can paint it in colors depending on the depth. And so you can see in purple, those are our Canaanite storage jars uh, that um, now we could actually measure them. We were actually able, using those hundreds of thousands of data points, we're able to figure out, we had originally thought that these three foot tall jars would have held 50 liters of, of some liquid. We were guessing it was wine or olive oil or something, but the LIDAR told us, no, we were wrong. They didn't hold 50 liters, they held 113 liters each. So that meant we had double the amount that we had originally thought. And so this is how we got down to it. There's the Canaanite jars, and we were able to actually um, use the ruler uh, and measure it very precisely. Okay, um, moving on, because I'm already out of time. I could be spending, by the way, I could spend six hours on this, but you guys probably have something else you'd rather to do. So let me say, um, is it easy to learn how to dig? Absolutely. These are going to be the tools of your trade. It will um, differ depending on where you are in the world. But I've mentioned my little patiche a couple times. That's it over here on the left. It's got a sharp point on one side uh, and a broad blade on the other. Looks a little like a geologist rock hammer, but it's a little bit different. My tried and true Marshalltown trowel next to it. My mother gave me that trowel when I was 21 for my birthday. 
best presents you could ever have gotten me. It's now older than any of the kids that I teach or take on my digs. So they say it's an artifact. And then I say, well, what does that make me? And they're like, don't get us started. But you've heard of dinosaurs, right? I'm like, oh, that one hurt. All right. So lots also of brushes. You are going to brush the dirt. Um, you think your kitchen's clean? Try an archaeological site. It's even cleaner, all right, that we have to. And also a pickaxe. You see here Israel Finkelstein, probably the most famous archaeologist working in Israel today. Um, I worked with him at Megiddo for 20 years. And one of his favorite sayings was used properly. The pickaxe is the most delicate instrument on the tell. And what he's doing here is shaving or straightening a bulk. That's the side of our trench because you can see the history of the site in that bulk. All right, so the easiest way, um, the correct way to use a pick to dig is to hold it and bring it up to about your hips and then let, just let it drop. The weight of the pick head, the gravity, will drive it into the ground about two, three inches, and then you just pull it back and you dig that way. You do not ever swing it above your head. This is the wrong way to use a pick because in part, you might brain the person next to you, but also because, and this is a true story, one of the digs I was on, um, somebody swung a little bit too wildly, actually missed the ground, if you can imagine that. The pick came up under, hit their kneecap and drove it halfway up their thigh. Uh, they were in a body cast for the next three weeks or so. So um, I'm not kidding when I say be careful using the pick. So this is the correct way to do it. This, this is not the correct way to do it. All right. So just keep that in mind when you're on your next dig. We also tend to um, really not use the pickaxe that much. Here are all of them using these little um, patishim in Hebrew, plural of patish, and trowels, and everything goes in different buckets. So the pottery will usually go in the black buckets, the bone will go in the yellow buckets. Um, if you're finding little bits of glass, it'll go in the blue buckets, whatever. The dirt goes in the wheelbarrows and then gets sieved and tossed out. The one thing that surprises most people is to know that we very, very, very rarely use dental tools, mostly because you can't dig very fast using dental tools. Really, the only time we use them is when we find human remains, and that's what you see uh, this guy here. Bill is excavating a human skull with a dental tool. I always ask my dentist whenever I go every year if I can have their broken tools because they usually just throw them out. I'm like, don't you want it used on an excavation? And they're like, yes. And if you find something with it, give me credit. I'm like, of course I will. Of course I will. So that particular one, that skull belonged to a young lady who left her shoe behind. She tripped going into this room when an earthquake hit the house that she was in. This was a Roman villa on Cyprus, and it was hit with an earthquake in about, if I remember correctly, the 360s CE or AD, depending on what you want to call it. But she lost her shoe, tripped, the whole house came down, and then we found her and excavated with dental tools. So we do owe our, our strategy for excavating to a number of scholars that began this field. Sir William Matthew Flinders Petrie, maybe a name familiar to you. He's got the best name in archeology. span And Petrie, who started out digging in Egypt, ended up digging in what was then British Mandate Palestine, now Israel. He is the one who brought the concept of stratigraphy to us, that is different layers that are in the mound one city after another after another. And he also uh, introduced the idea of pottery seriation, which I'll get to in a moment. But these two were also instrumental. Sir Mortimer Wheeler and his most famous student, Kathleen Kenyon, who dug at Samaria and Jericho and Jerusalem. And they invented the same method that we still use today, namely digging in squares five meters by five meters with a bulk in between so you can walk on it. But this is where you can look in the sides of the trench as you are excavating because it will leave a stratigraphic record. So this is one of our five meter by five meter trenches at Cabri. 
and you can see the different stratigraphic levels. In our case, we have four phases of a palace that is modeled, remodeled, re-remodeled, re-re-remodeled, and you can see each of them in our bulk. Some of it is even more clear. This is one of my favorite pictures from Cabri. It looks like kind of an ice cream layer cake. We've got one floor all the way down here. And then for some reason, they bring it about three feet of earth. They do another floor. They live there for a while. They refloor it. They live there for a while. They make another floor, live there, make another floor. So you've got one, two, three, four, five floors here, all documenting the history of the site. Petrie is the one that told us about that. He borrowed it from geology, this whole concept of stratigraphy. And you can see it at every site you go. This is a site that I dug at in Egypt uh, back in the 80s. You can see the different levels and the stratigraphy. And same site with different walls from different cities. So how hard is this for you to do? Not hard at all. I can teach you how to dig in about 15 minutes. It's just like gardening in the backyard, uh, except that everything's 4,000 years old and nobody's touched it since then, or maybe 400 years old or whatever. But anybody can do this. You even get the directors involved. This is Jack Holiday at Mascuda measuring things on the last day. Okay, two last things. I know we're running a bit over here, but how do you know how old something is? This is where the science comes in, but basically this is Asaf asking me uh, on behalf of all of you, how can you be so certain of your dates? Well, because it's so old, I get that asked all the time. It's so old, how do you know how old it is? Well, it's because we've got radiocarbon dating, we've got written texts that mention dates, we've got synchronisms, we've got um, dendrochronology, which is dating from trees, and very frequently, we will not give a specific date, but we'll say plus or minus. So like 1200 BCE, plus or minus 30, right? And that gives us some wiggle room. So we've got absolute chronology where we can actually have the date in years. And we've got relative chronology. This is older than this, right? We do that kind of all the time. So give you some idea, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but these are some of the dating methods that we've got. Carbon-14, radiocarbon dating, probably the most common. If something lived and breathed at some point, we can date it. All the others are, depending on the, the age of your site, whether it's hundreds of thousands of years or just a couple of hundred years. So C14, as I say, is about the most um, prevalent uh, and has been since the 1950s. But even this has a plus minus, as I show you here, We've got a range of dates for each of the bits of carbon that we're able to date. But we've also got, if we find enough of a chunk of wood that we can look at the tree rings, we can also date it that way. And the correlation is quite frequently to bristle cone pines from California. And they've got an entire sequence and they see if it matches up. One of the newest still being played with Somebody discovered that if you um, make a, um, a clay vessel, a bowl, a dish, a cup, or whatever, and you put it into a kiln to fire it, all the water that's in the clay will go out. It'll dry up. The minute you take it out of the kiln, it will start to reabsorb water from the atmosphere. You can't see it. You can't feel it. You really can't weigh it or anything like that. But you can date the day that it was fired, because the minute it comes out, doesn't matter where you are on earth, it will reabsorb water from the atmosphere at the same constant rate, which is kind of cool. This is in its infancy, but I think we're going to see more of this as it goes along. So this is similar to what you can do if you're working with stone tools, and there's like a piece of obsidian that's been worked as a tool. Same thing, if you knock a flake off obsidian, that fresh face will start to absorb water right away. This is if you're on something that's, you know, 100,000 years old. But the hydroxylization for the clay, it works even if it's only like 400 years or 60 years or 1,000 years. All right, but pottery, this is the other thing that Petrie did. 
was he realized pottery goes in and out of fashion. And that if you can figure out when it was in fashion, you can date relatively two different sites and say, oh, you're using the same type of pottery. These levels must be pretty much synchronous. So we owe that um, to Petrie as well. And it is therefore his fault that if you go on a dig, that every afternoon you will wash the pottery that you found that day. When you first go on a dig and you start finding all the pottery shirts, you're very excited. You write home about it. By the end of the three or four weeks, you're like, oh my God, I found a hundred shirts today. I got to wash them all. But you have to wash them so that the experts can look at them and date them, what we call reading the pottery. So this is like Alex Jaffe on the right and Oded Lipschitz on the left, um, say, looking at early Bronze Age pottery here. And uh, one of the guys from uh, Tel Anafa, the first dig I was on looking at the pottery, uh, and he was one of the ones that said to me, you did not find a um, prehistoric monkey's paw or a petrified monkey's paw. All right, and then last, do you get to keep what you find? Short answer, no. Nobody gets to keep what they find, not today. Um, you have to leave it in the country uh, and you study it there. So you alternate finding seasons, digging seasons with study seasons. The last thing that I want to, the, what I want to leave you with is the question about future archeology. span What tools are they gonna use in the future and what will they think of us in the future? The tools, I think pretty easy. Science is gonna be um, continuing. So remember the jars at Cabri? We used already organic residue analysis. The, what was in the jars is long gone, but it has seeped into the clay as it was holding the liquid way back when, 4,000 years ago. So we were able to take sherds from the jars, extract what was inside the clay, look at it using a gas chromatography machine, uh, in this case, back at Brandeis, and we're able to determine the acids that were in it. And then the big thing is, what would have the acid have come from? So we had like 40 jars, as I mentioned, the first year. Now we've got like 150. Most of them had tartaric acid. That's from wine, either red wine or white wine. They all had syringic acid, that's red wine. It can be grape juice too, but I rather doubt they had 20,000 liters of grape juice, right? Wine, okay, fine. But then it was the other acids that were interesting and it turns out they're from additives. They were putting in honey, they were putting in mint, they were putting in juniper berries. And of course they're putting in resin to preserve it because they don't have refrigeration back then. So we can now, recreate this wine. And in fact, there is a winemaker in Israel who just this past year has tried to recreate this Canaanite wine from Cabri. So that's, what's, that's where we're going in the future, is that kind of science. Also DNA. We're now doing genetic testing on the skeletons. Most famous is from Ashkelon that was done back in 2019. This is also the way of the future is looking more at the DNA, and we actually have tried to do this at Cabri um, without any success yet, but that's only because we haven't tested the samples because of COVID. Everything stopped at the laboratory. So we've got some samples waiting to be tested from Cabri. But the other thing that, and this is what I wanna leave you with, is what are people gonna think of us when they dig us up? Let's say some catastrophe happens and that we're all gone, but our buildings are still here. Um, maybe not in 20 years, but how about in 200 or 2000? I would ask you, think for a minute what they're gonna think when they find the remains of a McDonald's. What are they gonna find when they come up with the remains of a Starbucks? And what, <laughs> what are they gonna think of when they dig up the Washington Zoo and any one of the Smithsonian museums or the Met? or the, the Dinosaur Museum in LA, right? That's really, it's gonna throw them all for a loop as to what we were doing. Personally, I think they're gonna misinterpret McDonald's and Starbucks. And they're gonna think that they are temples and that you've got Ronald McDonald 
and that lady with the flowing hair as the head of the pantheon, like Zeus and, you know, and Hera or Juno and Jupiter. Um, and I don't know, for some people, Starbucks is a religion. So who knows? Anyway, I'm going to be very interested to see. Uh, of course, I won't see it because I'll be dead too. But I would love to know how they misinterpret our culture, because I'm sure that we are misinterpreting a lot from antiquity. They're just not around to tell us that. So with that, I would say if you want to go on a dig, go to um, ASOR's website or Biblical Archaeology Society's website. They've always got a list of digs. AIA has a list of digs as well. And uh, as soon as COVID permits, you too can go on a dig and use everything that you've just learned. Hopefully 2023, you'll come on my dig at Cabri, but you're welcome to go on anybody else's as well. And with that, I remind you that I would rather be digging. That's, that's the way it is. So thank you very much. And I went almost exactly an hour. I hope we do have some time for questions. Thank you. Um, great adventure taking us on. We don't have, all have the opportunity like um, Uvaho to go on annual summer dig. So this was a great way to learn as much as we could within one hour. So I, I've been following people's questions. Here are a few questions that have come up. Uh, number one, uh, volunteers, do you have to pay to go on a dig? Or do they pay you or is it kind of a, <laughs> a, an exchange? Oh, you have to pay. Absolutely. That's mostly how most digs run their, um, run their digs is off the volunteer fees. It'll still be a very reasonable fee. So for instance, at Cabri, I think we charge $700 a week, which is a hundred a day. Um, but that's enough that we make a little bit, we mark it up a little bit from what we actually pay. And so I'm able to run the dig off of the volunteers fees. But I will say that about three or four days into it, you're going to look at your neighbor in the trench and go, remind me, we're paying for this. And I'm like, uh-huh. Yeah. We actually say we usually mislabel it. We should um, label them as, as health health fitness centers, because you will lose weight, you will come back with bigger muscles than you went, but you will at one point go, I can't believe I'm paying for this. But yeah, so you will pay and you will volunteer, but you'll okay. love it. You will absolutely love it. You know, Iuva goes back every year, so I assume she is an example of someone who um, loves it. Uh, how much does it cost to do an annual dig? On average, I know. I know like, like if I'm running a dig, if yes. I'm running a dig, it it cost me um, between twenty and twenty five thousand dollars per week. But that's for everybody. When I have a team of like sixty people, so that's room and board for everyone. That's the buses. That's the tools. That's everything. And so that twenty five thousand is what I'm going to use the volunteers' fees for, plus also. Um, the universities will give us something like I usually get about 10,000 from GW. Haifa gives us that in kind. Um, then if we're lucky, we get like a grant from National Geographic, National Science Foundation sometimes. Um, and then uh, as they say on PBS and donors like you, right? So that's where the money comes from. But so an average season at Cabri, which is six weeks long, will run me about $150,000. And I know that for a fact because I have to account for every shekel to GW. I need to give receipts so that they see I'm not lining my pocket and that every nickel or shekel that I say I spent went towards the dig. So it's, it's expensive. A dig like Megiddo with 200 people there, it can easily run a quarter of a million dollars for six or seven weeks. Um, other questions came, is there an age limit as to how old, you know, is there a limit as to how old you can be to go on a dig and how good is the food that you serve to the people that volunteer? <laughs> good. Very good questions. There is not technically an age limit. Um, I never refuse anybody because of their age. I do say that if you have trouble getting in and out of the trench or kneeling down for long periods of time that it might not be the thing for you. Uh, and I literally feel your pain. Uh, I have trouble already now getting down into the, into the trenches. But what we also do is there's always roles um, at the table for like the registrars and even back in the camp office. So if you're not physically up to digging for eight hours a day, there's still probably a role for you. So, um, and then, yeah, what was the second part of the question? 
how 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 good is the food? We assume it's very oh, how quality. good is the food? Yeah. Oh man, how good is the food? It depends on the dig, and it depends on the dig director. Me, the food is amazingly good, because I, as a youngster, went on digs with food that was so bad that I swore if I ever ran my own dig that the food would be good, because. An excavation is like an army. It travels on its stomach. And if you want people to work hard and work well, you have to feed them well. So if you come on my dig, you're going to get good food. Other digs, not so much. I was on one dig where they didn't even give us lunch. And then, oh my, well, I lost so much weight on that dig. On the one hand, it was great. On the other hand, it was horrible. So that's one thing you actually want to ask if you're thinking of going on a dig find a veteran who's been on that excavation and ask them how the food is. And if they say it was terrible, look at another dig. There are so many other digs out there that you can find one that is finding good stuff and will feed you well. But from my point of view, that's probably the single most important thing is whether they feed you. Second, do they have air conditioning? Do not go on a dig without air conditioning. You need it. You will die otherwise. Terrible, terrible, terrible. I know digs are like, oh, no, we're roughing it. I'm like, you're not roughing it. No, no. So food and air conditioning. Well, in, in a related question, Tom Barth wants to know about the accommodation. So is it like um, 10 people in a tent? Is it one person per tent? Do you share a tent? Do you share a bed? Is everybody in a bed together? What, uh, how do you do that? This is a great question. And again, it depends on the dig. Um, I've been on digs where we slept on um, army cots out on a soccer field. But uh, again, I said when I'm running my own dig, uh, it's going to be in air-conditioned rooms, no tents, no showers shared by 50 people. I can't believe I've been on a dig that did that. Um, so, you know, your own rooms. So it can get a little bit more expensive, but not always. Uh, because the the kibbutzim and the um, like the field schools they're eager for our business. So we were up at the Western Galilee Field School for about ten years, and they loved having us. They gave us great rates. So, um, but again, it depends on the dig. You could be in a tent sharing it with ten other people with one shower, or you could be in a place where you've got a nice double, where you've got one room uh, made or your significant other. And the two of you have a private bath. It just depends. To be perfectly honest, on our dig, it's mostly rooms with six people, but that's for the college kids. The um, more advanced of us, shall we say, can ask for their own single or double, uh, and it's not much more expensive. So again, so maybe that's that's up with my ask about the food, ask about air conditioning, also ask about the accommodations. Great. Can you tell us, there was a good, great question about um, going back to Israel, the climate in Israel. How much has it changed? You know, we live in Southern California where apparently we were underwater in an ancient seabed here quite a long time ago. What, what was Israel like way back in the past? So same sort of thing. In fact, Safio Sarlando, my, my co-director and colleague, uh, is doing underwater archaeology now uh, off the coast at Tel Dor and other places. And yes, they're finding evidence. There's a Neolithic site they've found that is now under um, a couple of meters of water. So we've got the same sort of thing where the shorelines have um, changed over time. So yes, you, if you're into uh, maritime archeology, span you can go on an underwater dig uh, as well. So, yeah. Um, there was a question about archeologists and preconceptions. So in the old days, archeologists I assume went to try to prove or disprove biblical stories, maybe prove, I don't know. Then they maybe change to disprove it. Do you know where are we today? Do archaeologists go with ideas of what they want to find or expect to find, or they just go to find something and then interpret it later? Um, we do not go with preconceived notions. Um, when people ask me, uh, you know, what do you hope to find? I'm like, whatever is there, uh, I will find. It will speak to me. Uh, it will come out. So we do not go with preconceived notions. We're out. We're not out to prove or disprove anything. That's actually the hallmark usually of an amateur archeologist where they say, we're gonna go find Noah's Ark or the Ark of the Covenant or whatever. Um, most archeologists these days, um, like I say, no preconceived notions. And we're actually usually 
trying to answer larger questions, theoretical questions, anthropological questions, rise of rulership, um, looking at the invention of agriculture, looking at the domestication of plants and animals, things like that. So um, not usually preconceived notions. Now that's different from knowing what might be there. So for instance, when we were taking the DNA uh, at Cabri, we dug into an area below where we had been before and we found a painted floor. We only have 10 centimeters by 15 centimeters, but I know that painted floor is there and it matches the floor that the previous excavation found, but it's in a different building. So I was able to apply to National Geographic saying, I know what we're gonna find. We're gonna find the rest of the floor. I just need like a lot of money to do it. But that's different from a preconceived notion. And then we're out of time, people have more questions, but we're gonna have you back. Someone asked about the 1157 lecture and, the, and your follow-up lecture. We're gonna have you actually do the 1157. Um, lecture for us and that will cover some more ground and answer questions I think that people are asking. My final question is just um, um, you started you you taught you shared the story about the monkey paw and seeing it and then disappearing. It appears I mean it seems to me there's lots of great finds that are just in basements in Israel for example or other parts of the world that people never see or just see sometimes. Is it just I mean who decides what's going to go on exhibition and, and are there great things that are just sitting in basements and boxes? I know you you I made a joke about the Ark of the Covenant, and in the movie, it's in a box somewhere um, in um, Indiana <laughs> yeah, Jones. But in, in, in Washington, D.C. In Washington, yeah. D.C. But yeah. I mean, my assumption is that, you know, Hoover Ho goes dig. She finds something awesome. She wants to go see it in the museum. It's just not there. And so, you know, are there great things? I assume there's great stuff that you just can't see. How do you see it if it's in boxes in, some, in the basement somewhere in, uh, yeah. in a museum? This is... An absolute problem. Yes, exactly. And yes, so uh, Huva and Hi Huva goes back to way back. We've known each other for decades. Um, like her site of where she's been digging at Tel Gath has just closed down uh, after a very long time when Aaron was digging there. The finds, yeah, they're all in the storeroom. Some are in the museum and this and that. Same thing with Anafa, same thing with Megiddo. Um, it's up to the museum curators what they put on, on display. And frequently, that's why they will create new shows. Like uh, there was a show that Iran Arie and others created at the Israel Museum called, I think, Pharaoh in Canaan. That was a couple of years ago. And that enabled them to bring things up out of the storerooms that aren't usually on display. So it, it really is, yeah, I would say probably, I mean, I'm not a museum curator, so I don't have an exact figure, but 50%, 60% of the stuff is down in the storerooms. You're only seeing the tip of the iceberg that's on display. And it really is at the, I would say almost at the whim of the curator as to what you're seeing. So um, take advantage. If you know a museum curator, ask them for a behind the scenes tour. They're usually pretty happy to show you uh, and pull stuff out of boxes and all of that. But yeah, um, in a museum, you're just seeing literally the tip of the iceberg. So that's what we'll do with CSP. Jill Ratner had a few questions. I'll ask one of them. Um, what do you do when you when you have those sites? And you may have mentioned actually in Megiddo where you have layers and you're digging at one layer, but you want to get down to the lowest layer without disturbing the top layer. But you know, how do you how do you keep what you found on one layer and but still keep going down to multiple layers and um, not destroy your research, I guess that you've well so Achieved. This is this is a big problem, absolutely a big problem. It, it used to be like in the days of Heinrich Schliemann and all that, they would just go straight through the levels they didn't care about until they got to where they wanted. No, now we, every level is dug with love and precision and keeping everything because we never know who else might be interested in it. So um, that is part of the problem with digging a multi-period site that let's say you're interested in the early Bronze Age, but above it, there are Roman, Greek, and you know other layers on top. It's gonna to take you years to get down to the level that you want. That is in part why we jumped at digging at Cabri because it is a one period site. There is nothing on top of the Middle Bronze Age. We just found out, we think it's being, um, uh, it, we think it was destroyed by an earthquake and they never came back. So we're lucky about that. But otherwise, it is a problem. One thing that people do, um, for instance, at the site of Hatzor, 
uh, Amnon Bentor and others, they like they found a beautiful uh, remains. I think it was from the Iron Age, but they wanted to get to the Bronze Age levels. They simply picked up the Iron Age building and moved it to another part of the site that wasn't occupied and then dug beneath it into the Bronze Age layers. And I think that's a very elegant way to do it. I kind of wish that we had been able to do it at Megiddo because when I joined the project, it was to get down to the late Bronze Age and find the archive. We know there are six letters that the ruler of Megiddo, a guy named Biridia, wrote to Amenhotep III and Akhenaten, the Egyptian pharaohs in the 14th century. We've got those six letters. They, they definitely got replies. They're at Megiddo, but the late Bronze Age level in that part of the mound is underneath all of the later levels, including a palace from the Neo-Assyrian period, from the 8th century. I want to get back to the 14th century. Chicago was the one that excavated the Neo-Assyrian palace. They or we should have picked up the palace, moved it to another area of the site, and then dug beneath it to get to the late bronze. But that's expensive too, so we didn't do it. So yeah, it is a problem when you have a multi-period site. Um, last question. Um, tell us what your new book is so we know what to anticipate. What's it about? The, the new book that I'm working on is a sequel. Um, the original book, which I, I guess I'll come back and lecture on, 1177 BC, is about the collapse of the late Bronze Age. Um, came out in 2014. I just came out with a revised edition in 2021 because so much stuff came out in the last seven years that I needed to put together a new edition. Um, what Princeton University Press wants is the sequel. So what happened in the Iron Age? What happened in what we would call the Dark Ages, which I'm finding out are not that dark. So in the period from 1176, which is the year after the last book ended, to 776, which is the year of the first Olympics in Greece. I'm gonna look at those 400 years. And the question is how resilient or not were the societies that weathered the collapse of the late Bronze Age? And I'm finding um, that some are very resilient, like Cyprus, like the Assyrians, like Egypt. Others are not resilient at all, like the Hittites up in Anatolia, modern Turkey, or the Mycenaeans in Greece. And then we have an interesting situation in the land of Canaan, where the northern part basically collapses. The central part in what is today Lebanon, they're not only resilient, they're anti-fragile, as the word goes, and they become the Phoenicians. And they start spreading out during the Iron Age. And then down south in the southern Levant, well, the Canaanites, we know they become the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, right? Everything comes in, the Israelites take over. And so during this Iron Age period, that's the beginning of a lot of new, smaller kingdoms like Israel, like Judah, like the Aramaeans, like the Amorites, like, you know, you keep on going. A whole new set, a whole new set of people establish themselves in what is basically still the smoking ruins of the empires of the late Bronze Age, we now have smaller kingdoms of the Iron Age, and that is eventually going to lead directly to us today. So that's what the book is about. It's called After 1177, The Rebirth of Civilization, and it's basically, I'm going to relate it to today by saying, what do you do if your civilization collapses? How are you resilient? How do you transform or do you collapse as well? Because a lot of what was around in 1177, I see around today. And so I'm writing this just in case we collapse, that maybe there's some lessons from antiquity as to what we can learn uh, in case we go down and we have to reconstitute everything. So I'm about two thirds of the way done with that. I was supposed to be already done on December 31st. I've missed the, my deadline. But you know, as I told my editor, I'm writing about things that happened 3,000 years ago. What's another month or two now, you know, in the grand scheme of things? But it is scheduled, hopefully, to come out sometime in early 2023. 
assuming I'm able to finish writing quickly. So that's that's the project. Great. Well, we won't take up more of your time tonight, so you can get back to writing and editing. But thank you for <laughs> um, for uh, teaching us today about digging deeper how archaeology works. Thank you all for participating tonight. Um, great program. We look forward to having you back. We'll do. Um, the original lecture about uh, prior to 1177. Most people, I don't think, have heard it and love to have a recording anyway. Um, and thank you, everybody. Looking forward to seeing you this week with CSP. Be safe, have fun. And uh, we took our little guys up to the Natural History Museum today because um, Aaron has a fascination with dinosaurs. And, and you should have seen their faces running around the museum. They never, I don't think they've been to the museum. They certainly have never seen dinosaurs. So uh, the example that you gave, Professor Klein, of digging up um, you know, our time period and finding like dinosaur bones from the year 2020 will be very funny for those future people. But for my little guy, it was uh, quite a day. And maybe, who knows, maybe he'll be an archaeologist or maybe he'll be a paleontologist. I don't know. I just want to be happy. So take care, everybody. <laughs> have, a, uh, have a great week. See you soon. Thank you all. Take care. Stay safe. Okay. Bye. Bye.